Admiral Cox, Mr. Bruns, Commander McHugh, Captain Monahan, Captain Chadwick, distinguished guests and visitors, on behalf of the United States Naval Academy, good afternoon and welcome to this unique opportunity, the viewing of the British Royal Standard. Earlier today, midshipmen carried this standard from the museum to the display area behind me. They are another link in the chain, hearkening back to the War of 1812 and to the late 19th century when midshipmen were there for its last public viewing. Sailors from Annapolis Health Clinic in Lakehurst, New Jersey stand guard over the, over the standard to signify that our sailors, American, Canadian, and British, are ever present on shore and at sea. They are here to stand watch over this flag. Our Naval Academy band, the Navy's oldest and finest, has been providing music for the Brigade of Midshipmen since 1852, just three years after the Royal Standard arrived here. They honor our partnership by playing selections from the English composer Frederick Joseph Ricketts, who served in both the Army and the Royal Marines. The Royal Standard was captured during the Battle of York on the 27th of April, 1813. The joint Army-Navy forces under General Zebulon Pike and Commodore Isaac Chauncey burned York. The following year, a British force sailed up the Patuxent River, attacked Washington, and burned it. Now, please allow me to get one thing out of the way right now. To paraphrase the Lord of the Castle in Monty Python's Holy Grail, after Sir Lancelot has run amok at a wedding, quote, this is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's not bicker and argue about who burned whose capital. In 1814, a congressional act provided for the preservation of captured flags. President James Knox Polk's executive order of 1849 made the four-year-old Naval Academy the official repository for flags captured by U.S. Naval forces. In 1912, a pro Congress appropriated funds for the preservation of the flags to be exhibited in Mahan Hall. Amelia Fowler and 40 seamstresses saved them before she would go on to save the Star-Spangled Banner. There they remained for a century before necessity and conservation funds met to remove them and pres preserve them, much like the Star-Spangled Banner had to be removed and preserved for exhibit 20 years ago. Today, we recommit to our mandate and promise to ensure their preservation. The War of 1812 had a clear victor. That victor was the enduring peace between our countries for 200 years and the conflicts during which we have stood side by side in the trenches, in the desert, in the air, and at sea. As the Canadian poet Wilfred Campbell wrote more than a century ago, here at life's midday milestone do we stand, knowing our vision greater than our act, our possibility vaster than our dream. The viewing of this royal standard is a living testament to those who fought in the War of 1812, who fought for that standard, and who died for that standard. This is a friendship born out of the harshest of conditions of battle and war. And that is why our friendship, especially between our respective navies, has endured, because we know the consequences otherwise and we know what our history and heritage has taught us about the value of respecting our shared past and ensuring it remains for future generations. It is what civilizations do, preserve their own and each other's heritage out of our common humanity. To commemorate this event, the museum's boat model shop has made 60 challenge coins, some of which have been distributed. On the front is an etching from the Royal Standard with the words, the British Royal Standard and the US Naval Academy. On the back is an image of a sailing warship with the words, met in historic combat, joined in enduring peace. The wood used is deck wood from the USS Constitution. Now I'd like to depart from the program for just a moment. Uh, Midshipman First Class Carly Knapp, would you please join me at the podium? Midshipman Knapp is a chemistry major and will briefly discuss what her project is and what impact it has had on her. So. Hello everyone, gentlemen. Just speak loudly. Okay, yes sir. Um, so I'm working with Professor Lomax this year on analyzing the flags that the museum has had, including the Royal Standard. And it's just really opened my eyes to the special link between um, science and history. Uh, my research has really been the ultimate bridge uh, between theory and practice. 
and analyzing things such as the Royal Standard has just really given me an opportunity to apply um, the analytical knowledge that I've learned over time. So it's been really rewarding. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. So that you know, uh, the work that she has done with Professor Joe Lomax from the Chemistry Department is going to help us in our future restoration work of our flags, including the British Royal Standard, uh, where science meets naval history. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Director of the Naval History and Heritage Command, Admiral Sam Cox. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure and, a, and an honor for me to be here today. A special welcome to our friends and allies from uh, Canada uh, and the United Kingdom. Uh, the significance of this is that things change over the course of history, uh, and in this case, they changed uh, much for the better. Uh, I would quibble a little bit with Claude's description of the uh, enduring peace that occurred after the War of 1812. Uh, as late as 1917, uh, when Admiral Sims was getting his orders to go over to Great Britain just before the United States entered World War I, uh, CNO Benson told him that, hey, we just as soon fight the British as the Germans, uh, so don't get too close to them. Uh, fortunately, Sims ignored that instruction, uh, and we've been great friends and allies uh, ever since through some uh, incredibly challenging and, and difficult times. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Claude uh, and his staff of the museum. This is one of 10 museums uh, in the official United States Navy Museum system. Uh, it is an absolute gem. Uh, his staff is extraordinary. Claude is extraordinary. Uh, if you haven't been to the museum, you need to go. Uh, it's an incredible what they've been able to do. Uh, and the difference between what it is now and what it was when I was a, a midshipman here, uh, I forget how many years ago, almost 40, uh, when it was kind of an overgrown attic, uh, and I used to go there to hide from the, the upperclassmen. Uh, now it's now it's an incredible thing, and and the effort, you know, the the amount of work and and uh, uh, difficulty of conserving an artifact like this is immense. So everyone who was involved with that, my deepest gratitude and thanks. I think everyone, for some reason, my speaking notes said don't talk about the War of 1812. Uh, I, I figured our allies here know exactly what happened and know exactly how we got this banner. Whoa. And uh, so, so, so there's no secrets here, you know, among friends. Uh, but the point here is that we have it. It's our job as a Naval History and Heritage Command and the U.S. Naval Academy Museum uh, to make sure that this incredibly historic artifact uh, is preserved and cared for uh, in perpetuity. Uh, so that as long as it remains uh, in our hands, uh, we will do the absolute best we can to, 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 to take care of it. Uh, as the director of the Naval History and Heritage Command, you know, I control the money uh, for the whole command, uh, but I divvied up a fair amount of it uh, uh, to different, to different uh, you know, purposes. Uh, at the time, uh, Mr. Jim Bruns was the uh, director of the Museum Operations Division. He's now with the Navy League. Uh, but I'm, you know, a retired admiral. I'm not a museum specialist. Jim uh, has a long track record as an expert in museums. So I gave him a pretty long leash as to what to do uh, with the money that I provided him, big chunk of it for conservation. Uh, and this artifact is, is the fruit of that. Uh, and I'm very pleased to report that I think, my opinion, Jim uh, did an extraordinary job with the money that I gave him. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jim for a few words from you. Thank you, Sam. Claude, I want to thank you and Admiral Cox for the opportunity to address the group. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, for which it stands. And that's more than just a symbolic saying. We in our countries, all of our countries, pledge our allegiance to our flags. That's why 
flags matter. They are symbols of our aspirations, our desire, our history, and the nature of who we are as a people, whether or not we are Canadians or members of the United Kingdom or members of the United States of America. Theodore Roosevelt said that true friends are not those who are there in the best of times. True friends are the ones that are there in the worst of times. And we've had a true and abiding friendship with Canada and the United Kingdom for a very long time. Now, I've evoked the image of Theodore Roosevelt because he was the founding genius behind the Navy League of the United States in 1902. He also called upon that fledgling organization in 1908 to raise money to bring his fleet, the Great White Fleet, which he sent around the world. And unfortunately, he only had half of the appropriation to get it around the world. He sent us up to Capitol Hill to raise the additional money to bring his fleet home. Now, I also raise Theodore Roosevelt because while we had great aspirations, great dreams, and building a new fleet to challenge Germany and Great Britain and to spread the flag of the United States around the world, we didn't have the logistics capabilities to pull it off. So uh, we had to rely on our British allies, our British friends, to coal us as we went around the world. Flags are symbols. They are symbols of all of the uh, things that we hold dear. And why I raise that is because the royal standard that you see behind me is more than a war trophy. It's a symbol of friendship, an abiding friendship that has endured. In 1813, when the British, when the Battle of York took place in modern day Toronto, the Revolutionary War was still very fresh in the minds of Americans. Britain was embroiled in the Napoleonic Wars. Strife reigned in regions where stability now stands. This flag is a relic of that time when nature and mankind's thoughts were unpredictable. The War of 1812 took place in an uneasy time. Uncertain trade ruled and land and Navy tensions were commonplace. The York flag is now housed here in the Naval Academy and it serves as an important, important reminder that we must take care of all of our historic treasures and the roads of history that led them to us. Our peoples today are strongly bound by connected histories, by our democracies, which had their roots in our past, our common language that we somewhat share, is a little different than ours, and our shared trade and our basis for freedom and democracy. As has been said time and time again by Theodore Roosevelt, by Winston Churchill, and even by Prime Minister Theresa May, ours is a truly lasting and special relationship. That relationship is symbolized by the flag you see today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Commander Richard McHugh, Royal Navy, Assistant Naval Attaché in the British Embassy. On behalf of the Royal Navy, I would like to thank Claude and the team at the United States Navy uh, Academy Museum for their hard work and effort in restoring this standard. It is a privilege to stand here today alongside my fellow attaché from Canada to recognise our shared history and to honour the capturing of our standard by the United States. I have been asked to explain the history behind a royal standard. The significance of the capture of the royal standard cannot be overemphasised. Standards like this one symbolise the authority of the monarch. The flag captured during the War of 1812 is the only royal standard ever to fall into enemy hands. At the time of its capture, the flag represented the seat of government in York 
and was authorised to be flown by the monarch's representative abroad. Today, the Royal Standard flies only at the residence of the Queen or on her transport if she is travelling on official business. If you visit London and stand outside Buckingham Palace and look atop at the flagstaff, if the Royal Standard is flying, then Her Majesty is at home. The Royal Standard is the only flag that has never flown at half-mast, even at the death of a monarch. As the air ascends to the throne immediately, and there is never a time where there is not a sovereign on the throne. At times, a royal standard has variously been called and known as a royal banner of England, the banner of the royal arms, or the banner of the King of England. Over time, what we should call a royal banner of the United Kingdom has eventually developed into what is commonly known today as the Royal Standard of the United Kingdom. Harking back to the days where kings actively fought in armed conflict, the Royal Banner was used to identify themselves on the battlefield or on the high seas. Historically, a standard was actually a narrow, tapering, swallow-tailed flag of considerable length and was used mainly for mustering troops in battle or was displayed at pageants and funerals. The medieval standard was originally about eight feet long, though by the time of the reign of Henry VIII and the Tudor times, the length of a standard had taken on a greater significance and determined one's rank and nobility. A king's standard was 33 feet long, a duke's standard was 21 feet long, and that of a humble knight was only 12 feet long. These standards, or personal flags, were displayed by commanders in battle and bore livery and badges familiar to soldiers and their uniforms, and did not include coats of arms. For the English, a standard would also have had a St George's Red Cross acting as a symbol of national identity on a battlefield. At the time, a standard was subtly different to that of a royal banner, which was a banner bearing the personal coat of arms of England's reigning monarch. And this is actually, in its purest sense, what is displayed here today. Because the royal banner is a depiction of, a royal coat of, arms, of the royal arms of England, its design and composition has changed through history. The banner you see today was designed in the latter part of the 17th century and displays four royal arms. It is quartered with the first quarter, and that's the top left quadrant of the flag, and the fourth quadrant, which is the bottom right um, quadrant, representing the ancient King of Eng Kingdom of England. This consists of three gold lions or leopards on a red field. The second quadrant, which is on the top right, represents the ancient Kingdom of Scotland and contains a red lion on a gold field. The third quadrant, which is at the bottom left, represents the ancient Kingdom of Ireland and is a gold harp on a blue background. Wales is not represented in the Royal Standard as its special position as a principality was recognised by the creation of the Prince of Wales long before the incorporation of the quartering for Scotland and Ireland in the Royal Arms. This flag also has the arms of Hanover representing the title of Elector of Hanover and that is the arms in the centre of the flag. The Hanoverian Association terminated in 1837 with the accession of Queen Victoria, who being a female could not accede to Hanover, and so the royal standard that flies in the UK today does not have this coat of arms in its centre. If you would go to Scotland, you would see a different version of the royal standard, 
where the Scottish arms are in their first and fourth quarters and the English coat of arms is in the top right quarter. The painstaking restoration of this fascinating piece of our collective history speaks to the bonds between our nations that have been forged in both conflict and cooperation and in the shared common ideals of democracy and freedom that have underpinned our international friendship over the years. Although our flags have been pitched against one another in the past, they have much more often flown alongside one another as allies in war and peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Christian Monaghan, Royal Canadian Navy, Navy Naval Attaché, Canadian Embassy. Thank you, sir. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, for those I've not had the privilege of uh, meeting, I'm uh, Captain Navy Christian Mon, as Claude said, and I have the distinct honor of being uh, the Canadian Naval Attaché to the United States of America. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited uh, to the United States Naval Academy. Uh, again, I was here back in 1994 as a cadet uh, during an exchange program uh, when I played on my rep soccer team, so it brings back memories just being here. Uh, but it's an honor today to represent Canada for the unveiling of the Royal Standard, uh, which was captured, as alluded by uh, Claude, uh, the U.S. forces uh, in York, which was then Upper Canada, um, which is now Toronto, Ontario, Canada, uh, during the War of 1812. Um, I must say that this was a war that helped establish Canada's path uh, towards becoming an independent and free country. A war between neighbors that, in my opinion, taught us a very valuable lesson. When it comes to security, we tend to agree that our countries are stronger and the world is safer when we work together. Now, since the war, the end of the War of 1812, Canada soon after became an independent nation and joined forces to protect our continent. And the result? Canada and the United States of America enjoy one of the most extensive and long-standing, enduring defense relationships in the world. So commemorating key ceremonies of our respective nations' of history and rich military heritage serves to remind us of defining moments that made us who we are today. For these reasons, the War of 1812 regardless of the stories of U.S. forces invading Canada and capturing the Royal Standard, or the Canadians and the British forces coming to Washington and getting our own war trophies on display. This was a defining moment in our nation's history. So today, with the unveiling of the Royal Standard, I see this as a symbol and a time of introspection as we take pause to recognize and celebrate the unwavering friendship and enduring partnership that exists today between Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and the incredible shared military history between our nations. For generations, our military forces have served shoulder to shoulder around the globe, and as we gather around here today, we remember those who, at this very moment, are deployed in operations in the air, on the sea, under the sea, or on land, keeping our nations safe and secure. We also take this opportunity to remind ourselves of the many areas in which Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States are working closely together for the benefit of our three nations. As is often the case, in our closest relationships, we run the risk of taking things for granted and focusing on the small irritants. But I think that we need to remind ourselves and tell the citizens of our nations about all that we do so well together and how much better off each of our nations are because of our enduring friendship and partnership and by extension, how we were able to work together to address the very most complex global challenges. So I'm very delighted to be part of this celebration of our three nations and see such a wonderful turnout this afternoon. And I want to particularly welcome and thank my friends of the United States Navy, the United Kingdom's Royal Navy, 
who are with us today. Your presence uh, reinforces the importance of partnership and your personal commitment to its enduring success. And if I can fast forward today and use a hashtag, partners, hashtag partners in defense. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Captain Robert Chadwick, United States Navy Commandant of Midshipmen, United States Naval Academy. Well, good afternoon uh, and welcome to all. I know you look at the program and I am the last speaker and I know there's a lot of pressure to get this over with very quickly. But uh, I certainly want to uh, thank Admiral Cox and Mr. Bruns for the support of the Naval History and Heritage Command and, and their efforts to help us with these preservation efforts. And certainly a special welcome uh, to Captain Monaghan and Commander McHugh. And they both spoke about, uh, I think, what is captured on the back of this uh, coin that's uh, held in those enemy hands, as uh, Commander McHugh described them, but uh, met in historic combat and joined in enduring peace. And certainly uh, throughout my career, I have seen many examples of that cooperation. In my most recent operational tour, I served as the commander of Destroyer Squadron 21 based in San Diego. And in that role, I was a sea combat commander for the John C. Stennis Carrier Strike Group. And at the end of our 2016 7th Fleet deployment, we participated in the Rim of the Pacific exercise, uh, known as RIMPAC, which many of you may know is the world's largest international naval exercise. And while the John C. Stennis Strike Group served as the command element for that deployment, I did not serve as a sea combat commander. I turned those duties over to my Canadian counterpart, Captain Jason Boyd, and his staff. And I can tell you, looking back on how seamless that transition was and how during the planning process, the lessons and the ideas flowed freely, equally in both directions, I think speaks to the depth of the partnership and alliance between our two countries. And certainly my experience with the Royal Navy has been exactly the same. And probably the most memorable experience was when I was serving as the Chief Staff Officer for a Destroyer Squadron on the East Coast. And when we were working to certify our ships for independent deployments, we took them across the pond and we took advantage of the famed British training organization FOST, or Flag Officer Sea Training. And I can tell you it was some of the most challenging naval training I have ever experienced and some of the most challenging sea conditions I've ever experienced. I can say pretty uh, soundly that uh, we cannot match Cape Wrath in the winter anywhere on the east or west coast of the United States. But I think the fact that we used FOST in that manner speaks to the trust and mutual respect between our countries and between our two navies. And since coming to this role here, back to the academy in this role, I have seen additional examples of that partnership. For instance, we have had a Royal Navy officer on the staff here since the early 60s, and I won't make Gavin stand up and introduce himself, but he is a perfect example of why that partnership is so valuable. Certainly, we have had Royal Navy officers participating in our leadership and foreign affairs conferences, providing incredible insight. We're very fortunate that the last two First Sea Lords have visited the Naval Academy and provided their leadership and maritime perspective to our midshipmen. And in our, you know, uh, Captain Monahan spoke about his experience as an exchange uh, student here at the Naval Academy, and certainly I have gotten feedback from our midshipmen who have taken part in that exchange we have with the uh, Royal Military College of Canada, and the feedback is absolutely amazing. And certainly we also have a partnership with uh, our Pipes and Drums group, with the uh, Pipes and Drums group of the uh, uh, Royal Military College of Canada, and I think our folks get a lot more out of that than our Canadian counterparts, but again, I think it speaks to that, uh, that enduring partnership. And I'm incredibly excited about uh, you know, this event today uh, because I think, and it's already been mentioned, that the unique perspective that our midshipmen get through these flags. Now, the Naval Academy is a treasure trove of history and historical monuments, but again, I think the flags provide a very unique perspective into that history. And certainly, all current and former midshipmen somewhere in their psyche have ingrained that iconic flag with Captain Lawrence's dying, don't give up the ship 
order. And so I'm going to work with Claude to, as we go through these pres preservation efforts, to periodically display these flags, possibly in the rotunda of Bancroft Hall, to give the midshipmen the exposure to that, because I think everything we've heard today speaks to how powerful this can be. So I'd like to thank everyone for being here, and I'm sure after everything you've heard, you're dying to get back up there and look at it again, uh, knowing the history. So I'll uh, just say, uh, again, thank you for attending today. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the ceremony today, and uh, as Cap Captain Chadwick said, I invite you to go to the upper level. It's a, it's a great view of the Royal Standard from there. Thank you very much, and have a great weekend.